Thanks, Craig. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think it's quite nice that Janetta started with the presentations because I think she set a good platform for the discussions that I'm going to have. Um, although she indicated that we will be dealing, I will be dealing with a chapter on economics, I'm not going to deal with all of the economic implications, but I'm going to focus on the part that deals with hunting. And for some of you that have followed this story, uh, some of the slides won't be new to you, because a lot of this we actually predicted some years ago, and this is actually sort of uh, the point where we said everything that we predicted actually happened, and this is the results and demonstrating that when we started with the, the game industry, it was initially just game farming and one course with his farm and so on. But we moved from that to what we call now the wildlife industry. But in terms of our approaches, we were still stuck into the one course with his game farm approach, and we didn't adapt to, to common business principles in the wildlife sector, and that has cost us dearly. Um, so, if we talk about the business of wildlife, um, all of us would like to see ongoing profits. But what does ongoing profits mean? It's actually sustainability in terms of the, the income or the, uh, the, the profits that we generate. And it depends on who you talk to, what those profits are. If you talk mostly to the conservation community, the profits that they see in the business of wildlife management is primarily conservation outcomes. Um, if you talk to those in the private sector, the ongoing profits that they look for is primarily financial profits. But the question I'm asking is, what is the requirements for sustainability on both these sides? So if you want to see ongoing conservation outcomes, what is your requirements? And if you're on the private sector side and you want ongoing financial profits, what is the requirements for that? And I'm going to talk a bit about the, the private sector and the wildlife uh, industry, um, trying to come up with some recommendations on what are those requirements. So Janetta touched on this. This is just a graph showing the, the growth of the wildlife sector. And initially, the wildlife sector grow, grew out of the conservation sector. And the first game, farm, uh, game auctions were actually cased in wildlife that actually had game auctions and started selling game to the private sector. And so the wildlife industry grew. And in 1990, uh, 1991, with the promulgation of the Game Theft Act, was this whole issue of ownership. And then the whole scene changed. The focus from conservation outcomes started shifting towards economic and financial outcomes. And you can see there what happened with the, the, the value um, and economic contribution of the wildlife sector. And this is just a graph displaying that. So you see there were two major booms, or three major booms. The first was after 1991 with the Game Theft Act. Then round about 2009, um, we started seeing um, int intensive breeding, but primarily for the rare species. But in that same period, after 1991, we also saw things like the lion breeding starting. And I don't know whether you remember the Cook Report. That was something here in 1987. Uh, we saw the 1997. We saw the Cook Report, which, which was all about canned lion hunting. And then a bit later, this whole new growth in the sector when we started seeing the breeding of color variants and things like that. So those were sort of the, the major booms in the wildlife sector growth. And you could see that in all of that, it had to do with intensification. Because from an investment perspective, people wanted to reduce their risks and their, their input costs. So this was all economic decisions that were taken from the wildlife sector. So if we look at what happened um, at the sector from the producer side, the game farmers or the game breeders, for them to keep on having a competitive advantage, and this is sort of economics 101, what did they have to do? They had to reduce their input costs, lower their input costs. They had to increase their profits, and to do that, they had to reduce their, their risks cost factors, and that they did by 
making the camp smaller, putting up all these high fences, started doing all this veterinary um, interventions and things like that. And this is sort of the return on investments that we saw at that point. Now, the talk of the time there was that these guys can outcompete the JSE. I mean, with those sort of growth on, on your investment, this was seen as the best financial commodity. So now it changed. It had nothing to do with wildlife anymore. This was purely a financial commodity. It could have been gold. It had nothing to do with the fact that it was wildlife. But a lot of the arguments were still, but hey, we're contributing to conservation. But people started asking questions and saying, you know, this is purely financial profits. Now, where's the conservation contribution? So it even went so well that this is sort of the picture that happened in terms of the wildlife sector. The wildlife sector totally outcompete the general economy in terms of growth. We see growth of 2.9.3%, while the general economy was at 1.5%. So even the government said, hey guys, this is where we should focus our attention, so let's look at this biodiversity economy. So it's nothing to do with Nkus and his game farm anymore. This was now the wildlife economy and about creating jobs and all of these things. So it was a total different focus to where we started. So now we're playing in the big leagues, but we still do our maths as if we are in kindergarten. And I'll show you that, how that happened. So from a consumer side on the... Let's use the hunters as a case study. What happened? There you can see the details of the hunting sector. The hunting sector is actually the biggest contributor to that wildlife economic growth, um, with about 300,000 hunters in South Africa. Consumptive hunting or the meat hunting contributing about 8.6 billion. Trophy hunting about 1.6 billion. And although the meat hunting sector grew, the trophy hunting sector start, we see, started seeing a reduced number of international hunters coming to South Africa. So there were some red flag, flags uh, around that. And then in terms of food security, 20% reduction in red meat sales during the hunting season. So these guys really contributed to the economy. So it was also not just the Brana Wijn Bakke Yachters anymore. These guys had a big economic footprint. And the uh, government said, yeah, we should look at this from an economics perspective. So let's look at this now from the trophy hunting side. And you can see here on the graph that although the income from trophy hunting actually continued to grow, look what was happening here with the number of international hunters coming to South Africa. And if you calculate that in financial terms between 2011 and 2014, and you see what these guys pay per trip coming to South Africa, that was a, a loss of 240 million rand. So even though we had an increase in the overall contribution, if the numbers continue to increase, we wouldn't have seen this. So something was happening, and nobody was sure exactly what that was. But let me show you what it was. So internationally, there was this growing concern and pressure from society about the impact of people on our resources. And it was not just about hunting. It's all aspects. As our resources and, and and people's impact on the environment is increasing, people are becoming more concerned. They want to see responsibility. And that's the same in the economic sectors. Whether you shell or BP, people want you to become responsible when you make money and you have an economic footprint on the environment. So on poaching side, we even started people saying, you know, poaching equals hunting, because they just want to stop any impact. And this is a scientific article that talks about this. We started seeing international trade restrictions and the ISN having to write reports to the EU saying, please, don't have this knee-jerk reactions. If you stop all, all imports of hunting trophies, there will be a significant impact on conservation and the contribution that hunting makes to conservation. 
at the ISN World Conservation Congress last year, we had session talking about what is the contribution of hunting worldwide? What is the threats? What is the issues? But irrespective of signs showing the contribution of hunting, responsible hunting to conservation, there's this growing amount of people that want to close hunting because of all these irres irresponsible practices that they see and of social media taking that and making that into something that is often put out there in society but without good substance and science supporting that emotional responses. And it's all about reputation. And those of you who've got a bit of an economic background will understand that reputation and reputational risk hasn't got anything to do with the real facts. It's about people's perceptions. And their perceptions is the reality. Whether that's the real fact or not, it's about the perceptions that they have and that create or that influence how they spend their money and how they make choices. So in the ICN, what we started seeing is that this was one motion that was tabled at the ICN, and this was on terminating hunting of captive pet lions and other predators in captivity. And what we also started seeing, this was now not just more about canned hunting, which is hunting in a small camp, it was hunting of captive bred lions. So even though they were bred in captivity and put outside in the bigger, bigger um, area, it was still seen as an irresponsible practice. And this was the response and the motion went through. And this is the number of countries and this is the number of NGOs. So you could see that there was worldwide a negative perception about the, pre about the practice. This was a motion on the impact of selective and intensive breeding. And part of this dealt with the contribution of the sector to wildlife-based tourism, and that includes hunting's contribution to wildlife. And here again, the motion went through. So people were starting to be, you know, raise their concerns and voices about some of these irresponsible practices. So what happened then on the producer side? And here I'm going to use the, the lion breeding situation, and um, Michelle is going to deal with that in a lot more detail on the bone trade, but I'm just going to focus on the trophy hunting side. So you can see here from on the trophy hunting income, most of the income came from lion hunting of captive pet lion. And this was the situation as a result of all of this irresponsible um, practices. Cecil the lion, I think the previous time that we hear was the launch of blood lions. And if you go and look, and it will be in the report, the social media pressure behind black, uh, blood lines and how the movie was showed in Parliament, in Australia, and in the EU, all of that built up negative perceptions around hunting. And now it was hunting. It wasn't trophy hunting or irresponsible hunting. It was hunting. Everybody was painted with the same brush. And this is the results. Um, we saw that international bans and, res and restrictions on exports of trophies. We saw enhancement findings where international community said only if you can show that hunting contributed to conservation will we accept the, the trophies for import into those countries. And that had a major impact on, on some of the practices. And in the case of lion hunting, of hunting of captive bred lions, we saw that 60% of the hunters came from America, but now suddenly there was this requirement. So there was a, almost a total collapse of the captive lion breeding industry related to hunting. So then they had to look at other alternative incomes where, uh, and I'm, I don't want to go into Michelle's talk, but there was a variety of income streams for, the, for that sector, but one of the big income streams for that sector has now actually been affected. And this was some of the initial research that we saw is that in a period of nine months after this, there was about 320 hunts that were cancelled, lost, about 78 million rands, 660 jobs that were lost, and we saw some animal welfare implications as a result. And this is according to SAPO, the lion breeding organization. And we also started seeing a loss in market share from to Namibia. This is some of the numbers. So you can see RSA Namibia in 2006, and this is how it switched around. 
so we're losing market share and this i just put in to say but there has been other examples where this actually happened and this was the tulip bubble years ago where it was also based on color variance and the internal asset value and that that was traded there was no relevance between the two so on the producer side this is then one what we started seeing because remember from the producer side they produced a product that they never made sure that the consumer market wanted they expected the hunters to want this and there's a certain percentage of the market that would do this and he called them the lunatic, lunatic fringe so there will always be those that would like to see but the majority of people including hunters said we don't want to be associated with this practice this is causing reputational damage to our business and for long-term sustainability we can't be seen to not be responsible and how we utilize the resource base especially given that people are more aware and more concerned about the impacts that we're having on the environment so this is what we started seeing economists were saying you know initially when i spoke to the agricultural economists they said so what's the difference between breeding sheep for slaughter and breeding animals in a camp for hunting and i said this is people's heritage they look at this very different to what they look at from an agricultural sector so we saw an oversupply of color variants we started seeing significant decreases in prices of some of these color variants some of it up to 80, 85 percent decrease and one of the concerns were a lot of people use this as an investment model so they took their pension money and they invested it in this and now they've lost all of that and why because they didn't take notice that this is now a a business venture and we have to when we look at business ventures we have to look at issues around reputational risk so what is the difference between this and the rest of intensive breeding the reputational risks is the same and this is this so if you're on an extensive system and you hunt it's okay if you can demonstrate responsibility and sustainability but if you breed you can't go back here and then still think it's going to be seen as a responsible practice and what we are demonstrating here is that everybody in the value chain is affected it's the breeders and the hunters that are being affected it's not just the one subsector so we have to look at this in the entire value chain and what the implications are and this is just to show lessons from the rest of the um, the business world is this is the fortune 500 companies look what they say about reputation and the importance of reputation in long-term sustainability look it's one of the top issues in terms of your long-term sustainability so to conclude to go back to that slide so what is the issues around here conservation if you want to be sustainable in the long term maybe you have to start looking at issues that affect society and on the other side of your financial look at the the issues that also affect society so societal impact and perceptions is very important in terms of your long-term sustainability i want to just focus on this slide so for long-term sustainability you have to look at economic profits minus the social and environmental cost and I'm putting this up and this is relevant not just for the private sector and for the wildlife sector it's also important for protected areas because your focus is on the conservation side but if you don't start looking at your economic viability in the long term and your perceptions of communities and your social impacts you might lose that also from a long-term sustainability perspective and here we have to look at financial issues ecosystems values social impacts so all of those aspects have to be considered when we're looking at various production models so in conclusion the way forward it's now more business as usual we have to look at triple bottom line profits social economic and environmental mental we have to look at sustainability from a different perspective not just your single-minded approach that we had up to now and we have to start looking at 
policy interventions to influence these processes and that could incl include things like the certification systems that we started working on on the one side but it also includes the policy models that we are having that at the moment provide incentives for the intensive side of the, the, the system and not necessarily for the extensive side of the system. Thank you.